All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio. You guys know what time it is. And right here, live on YouTube and the radio station Airways, we are joined by a Canadian legend. This individual has has played bass for so many iconic bands, and one of them being the iconic Gob. And of course, he's a radio personality. He is an author. This man honestly really needs no introduction, and he is a jack of all trades. We got Stephen Fairweather right here, live on the radio, and of course, YouTube as well. How are you doing this evening? How you doing, brother? How, how's your day going? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Just uh, just enjoying Monday. Looking forward to what the rest of the week has to come. You, at looking at your rest of your week, maybe a, not a spoiler alert, but you have some amazing guests. You've had some amazing guests on, but you're having some amazing guests coming in the future, man. You're really on a on a tear. It's amazing to see, brother. I gotta say, I'm I'm very. This is actually my second station that I've launched, and. I mean, just the support I've been getting so early on is absolutely amazing. Like uh, tonight, obviously, we got yourself. Tomorrow, I got Weedis, and I, I, I'm off a night. On the 12th, I got Cone of Sum 41. And as a punk rock fan myself, I'm sitting back being like, oh my God, like, how am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You got to give my love to Cone, man. That, that guy's a, a real sweet dude, man. He's a, he's a real uh, stand up guy, that guy. Hey, I definitely will uh, send that, send that, send that his way. But I'm pretty sure he he definitely already knows that because I know, obviously, Gob and Sum Forty One are very much connected because obviously, you know, Tom of Gob is also the guitarist for Sum Forty One now. So I'm pretty sure he's definitely going to see this interview. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Well, love to you, Cone. How you doing, brother? But also, I know you're a very busy individual, Steve, so I'm not going to take you to, uh, to, away from your Monday night too long. But I want to take you back to the early 90s where you actually became a founding member of the uh, Vancouver-based uh, band uh, uh, Waiting for God. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about the formation of this amazing group. And of course, like, how did you actually get connected with the other members? Yeah, man. Wow. That goes back. I was... Uh... 16 i was I, I wasn't a founding member i was a uh, kind of a fan of them and i, I um i grew up kind of doing punk rock in my pa basement my parents basement is lots of you know musicians doing shit and then i quickly got into kind of like a darker electronic music and it was through a friend named eric west um that uh had a band with him called corpus christi that was kind of like a skinny puppy uh band and then through them, a guy that we worked with on, with production was at a, in the band Waiting for God that was more like a, um, it was kind of like Susie and the Banshees vocals with kind of like heavier guitars, like ministry guitars. And um, I was a fan of theirs and just, uh, they needed a guitarist. It's kind of, I just kind of fall forward in life, man. I just kind of, I'm around and uh, when people kind of like leave or, or quit or uh, get fired, I'm kind of just in the background chilling and uh, just an easy dude to maybe ask to fill in the shoes of their guitarist before me. I forget who it was. They kind of had one or two dudes. And then, um, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing for me because I, I was in a basement, um, playing in a basement. And very quickly at the age of 16, I was on tour in America, which like to me at the time, I mean, still, but especially at a 16 years old in the 90s, it was my mind was blown that I got to let go on tour and that my school that my parents let me and that my school let me i'd had to like bring homework with me on 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 that tour and uh, do like homework and i even have to had to like leave shows i remember because i was 16 at the time and we're touring down it was just the west coast of the states when they would come and id people in the bar i would have to go on a walk it happened a couple times i'd have to go on a walk and then it was time to play i would go back go on stage and play the show but i legally wasn't allowed to be uh at the whatever goth bar we're playing at that day. And when you actually said, obviously you had to bring your homework actually on tour with you. If you don't mind me asking, like did that really, that affect your grades at all? Or did you actually not only knock it out on stage, but you also knocked it out in your schooling as well? Oh no, it, it pays. I was always stupid. So it didn't really, they didn't really see a, a, a downfall in, in my grades. Cause I was always shitty at school and I was even going to like a shitty school. I was going to a thing called work and learn in my province, which is kind of like an alternative high school. So they didn't really expect much, thankfully. But it was just a way for, maybe for them to be okay with me going is give me a couple of textbooks and give me assignments to do on the road. I never did. I was, uh, I, I never did any of them, but they never uh, put up a fuss about that. So that, love out to those guys. Love out to the White Rock Work and Learn. 
and I got to say as well, all, we uh, down here in Ontario, we have a thing called TR Leger, and that's where I personally got my diploma. And I got to say, they're very flexible. I think it's you only got to check in, I think, like once every 15 days or something like that. But definitely, this give you textbooks and you just do it on your own. It's kind of, it's very different from regular school. Oh, for sure. And they wanted you to work half the time too. And I remember half of my work at one point was at a recording studio in a town called New Westminster. And it was kind of rad being a kid and kind of learning how to, uh, you know, what the production side of, of music was. Cause growing up, we just, you know, we played shitty amps and like I said, in a basement. So I had no idea how that side of music was even made. You know, I was just, uh, playing community centers and shit like that. And also as well, a few years after that, in 1997, Waiting for God actually released their second studio album titled uh, Decipramine. I was wondering if you can actually tell our viewers a bit more about this particular project. And of course, from what you can recall, what was it like just being in the studio recording this honest? Honestly, it's a masterpiece in my honest opinion. Oh, man, it was fucking weird because um, it was like it was a heavily electronic band. It had the kind of heavier guitars, but... I kind of came as a young kid at like 13 playing punk rock and then going into that more in, you know, industrial electronic stuff. They're just kind of sampling you. So it was the weirdest thing, dude, because I went from just doing like, you know, shitty f Sex Pistols covers to like sitting in a a little studio and just they would just like sample riffs and then they were just kind of like, they kind of wanted that, especially in the 90s, they kind of want, wanted that s synthetic sounding kind of guitar like... um like all those bands kind of had, you know, it was kind of like those stomping anthem -y, KMFDM kind of style guitar. So it was the weirdest thing. It wasn't anything about capturing. Now bands like to try to capture their live sound or whatnot or have like a, um, a soul to their songs. But that shit was like kind of the, uh, it wasn't any production. It was like a reduction of, of soul and they wanted it more machine like. So it was a weird th thing. It was also a weird time for me. I was going through some <laughs> shit of my own. And that made it extra challenging. And, uh, um, but yeah, Damon, the singer, um, I still follow her on Instagram and she's killing as a makeup artist. And, uh, but she had a really, uh, an amazing, powerful, powerful voice for sure. And I got to say as well, the one song that I really enjoyed off that record was actually, excuse my language, but bitch, I, I honestly really enjoyed that song off that record. Oh, right on, man. I can't believe, I can't believe you even hear, have heard that record. That's amazing, brother. That's <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is uh, it definitely goes way back man way way back honestly i, I find it was an actual like a, just such a treasure man i do know that there was actually quite a bit of weight before you guys actually released the third record like if you don't know me asking what, what was the what was the weight for the third record like were you a part of the third record at all oh man what was the name of the third record do you remember i honestly cannot remember i did that that was just on the top of my head because i do know there was such a significant like time span between both records yeah there was a lot of addiction going on in the band at the time um a handful of us were going had uh heavy addiction challenges at that time and we're um some rehabs happened um and then infighting happened it was a real messy uh, like a like a lot of bands when you really get to know it when you read the like the vh1 behind the music bullshit it's always like a messy fucking marriage of relationship you know and a real marriage you know there's no sex it's just like fighting and uh which can happen especially at that age i mean i was a teenager but yeah just challenging personalities strong personalities with the main dude martin ended up uh, passing away um from an overdose um a little ways after the band broke up so everyone kind of had some demons so that was probably the main cause of uh that time lapse is just the uh the fucking demons and especially as well like a lot of a lot of bands as well like when they're in the limelight they get all the money and whatnot they're not used to having that money and then all obviously you know the partying starts and whatnot and then it just gets too too kind of too out of control yeah for sure yeah we i we never really reached that level we we were kind of had some fan bases the thing with scenes like that like scenes like um like hardcore or like post-punky stuff um and the gothy scene they're kind of people will go to your show just because you're on a certain label or just because you're in that scene they'll just kind of show up even if they don't know your band and we kind of had that especially when you get out of vancouver and we went across canada two or three times we got to see that which was amazing too again with like school books <laughs> and uh you could it was an insular kind of scene which was dope um 
but yeah, it's it definitely, if you're not ready for it, if you're not like, you have to be somewhat of a balanced person. And when there's, um, especially drug addiction going on in the band, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking, speaking totally personally, um, it's easy to, um, I don't know, just kind of lose yourself and fall down further, you know? And also as well, aside from being a phenomenal bass player, you are also a founder of the internet radio station uh, titled uh, Stranger Radio. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us about your your radio your radio journey, and of course, what actually ultimately made you decide to launch this radio station? Because I know you've been at, you actually had that launch for so many years now. Yeah, yeah. I started with um, a, a lady asked me a girl that I was acquaintances with, um, whose mom. Um, was a radio manager like Tresto radio like what you're doing like like og real radio um so she kind of came up in the radio world and she got asked to manage a online radio station in new york here called eight ball radio um that seemed pretty rad they had won a couple awards doing some shit and um i've always wanted to do a radio show ever since i saw the movie pump up the volume with christian slater where he had that private pirate radio station and i used to do like fake radio shows into um a boom box and like record them onto a tape totally like not know how radio works but I would, like, I would record myself like talking and thinking i was you know christian slater and shit um i probably still do it explains the haircut and she asked me to join that station um and it was so fucking intimidating because they actually had like a radio station somewhat they had this like this huge basement in soho area kind of by me in new york and they had like a little television studio in one corner. They were kind of like a political art like group. And they did like been doing zines since like the eighties and different names and shit. And when you'd go there to do the radio station, they would have like an assistant that would help you kind of set up your shit, which was good. Cause I'm, I'm an idiot. Like I said before, I didn't know how anything, anything works, but then you would broadcast over their basement, their studio, their radio station studio. And it was so fucking intimidating, man, because like, obviously I know some people are listening, mostly just like four of my good friends are listening, still the only people that really listen. But then everyone in the room is listening too, and it made me feel so like shrunken down and being kind of like a insecure dude. It made me feel so kind of shy and shit. Um, but I, I was so thankful for her giving me the shot because I like to do comedy bullshit and just make jokes. And just, I love sharing dope music, and I hope people find love. And where I find love, it's kind of like the most amazing thing about having a station. And, um, I was there for a year and then I kind of always just started thinking of like, man, it would be cool because I have a dope um, group of friends and, and a eccentric group of friends and, and some interesting gr girls and dudes that I know that are characters and funny and smart and have different tastes in music. And I thought I have such a cool kind of A-team uh, Ghostbuster, you know, like group of people that I know I think I can maybe start my own thing and kind of curate it myself and um, make it more eight ball the station I was on it was more New York based everyone was out in New York um, and it, I thought it would have been cool to open it up to uh, just anyone you know anyone that wants to have a voice to share music and say whatever they want as long as it's not like you know some bullshit um, and uh, so I, I got excited about that I got excited about um you know, I see it as a starting like um, a paper company, like people make beautiful drawings and, and, and paintings um, on Stranger Radio. And I'm just kind of giving them the paper, you know. And I got to say as well, going back to when you actually mentioned a few moments ago about how like your one of your first radio shows out in New York, you actually felt insecure when people were around. I definitely know that feeling, man. When I actually, uh, during my previous radio endeavor, I actually had one of my friends over and i had to do a had to do an interview he was sitting in the other room and just knowing he was out there i was like oh man he's out there judging me and shit like <laughs> it's, it's weird it's almost like you get into radio just so people can hear the voice and not see you if that makes sense oh for sure i always say i got a, a face for radio and voice for subtitles it, it's it's so weird because you, you it's also weird hearing your own voice it took me a long time especially in that room um because i hate my own voice so to get into radio and it's like blasting over the speakers that made me kind of talk quieter and softer and um and uh more unnatural than like my speaking voice and that kind of stuck because it just uh i don't know it's just this, it's kind of an intimidating thing to um to kind of trip out on especially if you're like you know a reserved uh dude you know 
And before we move off this topic, of course, I know individuals that might not know this side of Stephen Fairweather. Where can we actually listen to your radio station today uh, if people don't know how to actually navigate and actually get to it? Yeah, for sure. It's just strangerradio.com uh, is the website. All back uh, episodes are on there and every show has its own page. So like for you, especially, I would check out a show out of Denver by a guy named Jesse the Body he does a show called Punk is Dad. And he really specializes in this, a lot of stuff I think you'd get down on and uh, and a real rad dude and a great uh, on-air personality for sure. And just loves that kind of music and um your show kind of reminds me of his too, because it's kind of that um, a little bit of a throwback of the the punk rock of the you know some eighties, but like nineties and some early two thousands kind of a, of that of that wave, you know. I gotta say, I still listen to I still listen to that to a punk rock layer came out yesterday. I know it's two thousand twenty three. <laughs> some of my friends say, man, you know, there's a lot of great bands. I'm like, I do listen to the new bands, but sometimes you just got to throw on some gobs, some some forty one, blank one eighty two, and just vibe and feel young again. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, man. I'm fully about that kind of nostalgia uh, act and and uh, kind of throwback, you know, because it takes you back. You know, it takes you back, and um, that's a, an, an amazing thing that music can do. And also as well, in June of 2008, you actually joined Juma, Juno-nominated uh, Canadian punk rock band Gub. I was wondering if you can actually tell us the story behind that. And of course, how did you actually get the opportunity to actually join Gob in the first place? Yeah, um, same thing with the with the goth band, with the Waiting for God band. Just fucking lucky falling forward in life. Um, they went through like, they were kind of like a spinal tap of bass players. But instead of drummers, it was bass players. They kind of went through a lot. Um, and, uh, we were becoming friends, um, at the time that they kind of needed a bass player and, and over the years becoming quite close friends, um, with the guys and, um, and they're kind of becoming part of the family really. And, um, they, uh, Tom and Theo, um, had produced, I was in a band called by a thread and, um, it was the first, they, those dudes always kind of self-produced or co-produced their albums coming up. Um, but the buy a thread album was the first album that was just those two dudes on them by themselves producing an, an album. And it was lucky enough to be the band I was in. That was kind of like a post punk, post hardcore band, uh, the buy a thread band. And, um, I think it's because we worked together, uh, for so long making that album, um, that when it was time, uh, they just kind of knew I played bass somewhat, I mean, I'm a, I'm truly a, not a, I'm, I'm like a shitty bass player, to be honest. I'm like the third best bass player in Gob, but they needed someone. And, um, and yeah, I, um, I, I thought about it for a bit because I was still in the band by a thread and I kind of like, like just having one focus point at a, at a time musically because one, um, I can get kind of, um, I don't know. I can feel overwhelmed and I'm already struggling to kind of play songs. So to sort of play two ba uh, band songs was like, you know, insane to me because, you know, the lack of talent. Uh, but when that band um, folded up, um, we were still becoming better and better friends. And it was just a, a great kind of move, move to make. Actually, I went on, out on tour with them just as part of like the entourage one time for like a small West Coast tour um, just to like hang out. And it was so fun. Their shows are so fun. And it's something I never really thought about. I played in these bands growing up. They're always kind of like cool. The, the, and coming out of a town like Vancouver, there's a lot, a lot of kind of like cool kids. And the one thing about gob shows is that when you come to a show to see gob, you're just there to have fun. Like no one thinks they're like too cool when you come to a gob show. And it's just a group, a large group of like people that are just wanting to have fun and to sing. And that energy and that vibe was like so fucking amazing and something I didn't know I was missing, you know, and um, the funness and, and the, as cheesy it is, the closeness that was growing with me and the other guys, um, it kind of made it a no brainer, you know? And I don't mean to correct you, Steve. When you said a few moments ago about the lack of talent, man, I gotta say, I don't want to. I don't mean to correct you, man. But that Apartment 13 album that you guys did, <laughs> you you really displayed some amazing talent on that project, man. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, brother. Yeah, that was a fun one, man. We actually recorded that at my uh, parents' house. Actually, the last two albums were recorded at my parents' house. Theo uh, became a close friend of my family, and would house sit. Uh, for my folks when they would um, go down south for six months out of the year 
and we kind of set up shop for the buy thread album and recorded it there. And then we did, they did the gob album and then we did apartment 13 and um, yeah, that was such a cool time because we all kind of like lived together and uh, we would wake up in the morning and we'd go on a walk and it was close to the ocean and we'd walk. It was really romantic. We'd like walk the, the beach together. We'd get tea and then we'd like go to work and uh, make that album. And um, yeah, I feel uh, honored to be a part of that for sure. And I just got to say, while we're on the topic of that album, man, the, that song, the one song that I really enjoy is actually Radio Hell, man. I just, I absolutely love it. Just, just the chorus to that song. It's so catchy. Yeah, I know. It's, it's almost like perfectly catchy. And the fact that he's singing about the radio and having a song beginning played on the radio, and it's like the perfect chorus for a song to be on the radio. It's, it's quite a bit of a mastermind of, of Tommy to, to uh, work that together. It's, it's such a catchy hit. There's some songs you just can't argue with, man. Like, I hear you calling and um yeah there's some songs that make me fucking cry too man that uh the song wake up when i first heard the song wake up that sonically is such a different song for god because it's kind of um electronic beady and it's kind of um i don't know it's got like an it's got a different kind of vibe to it but the lyrics to it um and actually friends of mine too it made that song made them cry it's just such a beautiful kind of love letter to um to tom's mom and um yeah, so for like a pop pop punk band to kind of like make me cry, it's fucking uh, that's an amazing that's an amazing thing for sure. The one song that always gives me the shiver down my spine is actually an older one, but it's uh, Oh Ellen. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know, just that song is I don't know I don't know what about it is. Just how when he sings Oh Ellen, what can I do? It's just the it gets a shiver down my spine every time I hear it. I don't know if it's just Tom's voice or if it's just the song, but that's the one song that I'm like, man, this 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 song. It's oh, that's so perfect. rad. That is so rad. That is one of the biggest kind of um, songs when we do live that the crowd sings along to. There's a few of them, but that one definitely is up there. And that's always a, a highlight of the night for sure. And before we move off the topic of Gob, the one thing I got to ask, because honestly, a lot of individuals have been have been wondering this. And me personally, as a Gob fan, I've always I've always wondered this. I know Tom, I know right now, Tom, he's currently doing his stuff with Sum 41. But is there actually any plans to do another Gob album in 2023 or just in the near future? Yeah. The one thing about Tommy, he can't he can't not write songs like he'll always have dozens and dozens of songs that he just writes as he's even when i first met him before i really kind of met him met him and i just knew him knew his roommate and i would be in the same house he would always be in his room just playing like guitar solos and writing riffs and shit he's always writing um so there is hopes for that it's really as you said it's really with the dudes now uh with families with kids new kids other kids going to like to high school and uh and then the some some 41 stuff it's just kind of finding the time and and it's another thing too where um the band really blossoms it's kind of like there's a, a lot of bands like this but like um tom and theo when they're together i think they make the best songs and when they're separate um it's it's a different thing and i think the best gob is when they're kind of both together both writing even if it's just a tom song or a theo song um when they're together giving each other notes or, or influence or just like, you know, have each other's back. It, uh, it flowers so much more beautiful. And it's just finding the time for that. Thea was in New York um, just before the pandemic writing songs and they worked some stuff out. Um, but there is uh, hopefully a light in the tunnel. What we're kind of focused on now is the biggest demand um, – for for gob that i see in the comments and shit or or like dms is the vinyl like nothing's really come out on vinyl for gob which is insane and it's people don't really understand why and it's it's a lot to do with just rights it's a lot to do with recording rights and money rights right when you're a, when you're a band um as gob is um when you sign contracts you sign away certain rights that have to eventually when the label isn't fully into doing vinyl you have to wait until that time frame that you signed is over and then you can kind of take over and take it under your own wing. And that's what the guys have been slowly kind of working towards and doing and working out deals with the older labels is to get our rights back so we can actually press vinyl and get it out because we know, um, I mean, we want it cause that's dope to have. Um, but it, we know it's the number one thing that people ask for. Um, so hopefully a uh, new album, but before that we hope to relieve release, uh, all that shit on vinyl. Um, 
and hopefully soon. We know there's a backup in vinyl in the world of recording. Bands are waiting uh, for their pressings, but um, we hope to really... I know Gabe was on here. He did this as a rad job. I love Gabe's interviews. He's such a, a rad dude. Um, but I know he kind of broke the news with you, which is rad. Um, so I'm here to uh, uh, break it twice, I guess. Yeah, when he actually said that, I was surprised because I actually have a vinyl collection in my head. I was like, oh, man. If I can get if I can get some of those gob albums, I would be in heaven. Oh, I, have, I have the CD copies. Don't get me wrong. I, I I have the CDs. I love them. But sometimes you just want to put the wax on, kick back on your couch, and just enjoy it. I have the CDs for my car, but I have the wax for home. Yeah, it'd be rad. It, it would be rad to have it as like a box set, like all of the albums in like one box set. And I they're they're actually been. I mean, not to spoil nothing, but there's going to be some really extra behind the scene personal goodies in that shit too with some never before seen shit and things heard and uh we hope to make it real special for everyone that's been with the band for um for the amount of time they've been together and also as well just going back a little bit on january of 2011 you actually released your debut uh solo album uh titled you and yours i was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about your solo career and of course i uh, in 2023 i uh, can we actually still buy or stream your debut solo album today? Yeah, it's actually all free. Um, uh, I put it all up for free. Thank you for asking. It's just uh, I've always written like um, acoustic, you know, dreamy. I try to make it dreamy, um, like sad bastard songs, you know, and um, and with some friends producing on that first album and on the second album. Actually, Tom... Tommy from Gob uh, produced half of the second album and sang on a song or two songs and played guitar on a song. Um, I've just always written kind of songs like that and um, try to make use of my nasally voice and try to make it sound, you know, somewhat whatever. And um, yeah, if you go to stephenfairweather.com and click on discography, that album, uh, you and yours, my first solo album and my second solo album called Visitors, are on there if you click on it it'll take you to Bandcamp, and it's just uh it's free it's free just to download so you can just have them for free if for to join the dozens of people that have downloaded it and also as well in june of 2015 you actually appeared in a commercial uh for the lexus car company where you ultimately actually won the uh, csc award i was wondering what was it like being able to work on that particular commercial and of course, do you actually have any like any more plans that you do any more com commercials if the opportunity was to come up for you? Ah, uh, fuck no. That was just a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for asking. That was just a buddy, um, my buddy Todd. Love to you, Todd. Um, was was shooting it. He was a director. Um, he actually uh, was going to direct the Banshee music video for Gob and ended up do it, being the cinematographer for it. And he, he was a cinematographer, um, director of photography on on that, and, and then on this commercial. And I just got a text from him one time asking me if I can act. And I'm like, yeah, it's easy, just being a jerk. And he's like, okay, meet me here. And uh, a guy stood on a ladder with a hose and sprayed me with a hose for like 20 minutes. And then they, in post, they made it look like I was like standing in the rain like a detective in the 40s. And if you blink, you'll miss me. But it was kind of, it was uh, fun to do and just rad to uh, help out my boy Todd, you know, when you needed a uh, a guy to stand under a hose. Hey, I got to say, you know, it's not every day you can actually get a nice fat check for standing under a hose. Like, oh, I, I don't I don't know any other jobs that could actually pay that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a sweet guy. And also as well, aside from, you know, starring in a commercial, of course, being a bass player, radio, you also dabbled into the uh, into the art of actually literature as well, where on December 21st of 2021, you actually released your own book titled uh, the, the, Cole, uh, the Cole Brook Library 95 to 2000. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about this phenomenal book. And of course, what actually made you dabble into actually becoming an author? Oh, right on, man. Uh, it was just, it's just poems. So my... Um... I always wrote poems, especially during that time in that uh, gothy band during those kind of dark days, I would, I would write poems a lot. And, um, it was just a way for me to like work out shit in my head. It was like a, kind of like a diary, but I, I camouflaged it, um, with poetry. And, um, it was a connection with my mom. My mom was into poem poetry. I remember finding a book of Leonard Cohen's poetry when I was a kid and reading it. And it was so adult, um, and, and rad. It was my first kind of, um, 
door opening to there's a day when your parents become people and they kind of stop becoming your parents and you kind of see them as people and appreciate them as people and not just your parents. And, um, that was a, definitely the day that started with my mom. Um, so we kind of had that connection of Leonard Cohen's poetry. So for her, it was going to be for her birthday. I found all of these poems, these books that I had uh, from the 90s of my poetry um, that read um, to me. I enjoyed it because it didn't seem like my writing because it was such a different time. And with my with the addiction, it was definitely influenced in, in the in the poetry. And, and um, I wanted to put it together in a book for my mom for her birthday because I know how she liked poetry. And um, so that was the main kind of idea. And then I have a friend named Kim, love out to my girl Kim, who went to school. She got like a PhD in literature and poetry. And I sent them to her. I'm like, hey, and I know she published some poetry books. I'm like, hey, would you um, help me kind of put this out? And um, she was huge in support. Um, she felt that they were kind of cool enough to uh, just try to like put out. And she uh, wanted to show them to some people in her class and shit, which is so cool, kind of cool. So she helped me edit it and put it together. And it was just kind of like a, um, just a gift for my mom's birthday that turned out to be something kind of, um, I mean, just as special, but a different kind of special because it kind of became something that you can kind of show your friends. Like it kind of became something that I would send to um, my close friends. And it was kind of um, a real kind of personal um thing and, uh, and, and a different kind of, um, I don't know, a way to kind of connect to people and sh kind of show them that and to see that people even like bought it um, or that you can download that for free too on my website. If you don't want to download the hardcover off of Amazon, it's free on my site. Um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of enjoy doing it, enjoy doing it, man. So I appreciate you uh, even knowing about that. And also as well, because obviously these are poems from your past. Did you use up all the poems that you actually currently had? And if not, do you actually have plans to actually release a volume two in the future? Yeah, there's a bunch I didn't add because I thought they were, you know, shitty. <laughs> um, and I'm still writing. Um, I wrote one the other day on a postcard for a friend. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I was influenced um, when I was a kid. Around 13, 14, my brother was obsessed with Henry Rowland's, um, his talks that he would do and his books uh, on his label, The Artichoke Hearts. And he was obsessed with them. And he would read all of his books and and watch all of his VHS tapes at the time. It was the only way to watch that shit because it was the 90s and shit. And at one of his talks, I always found them engaging and funny. And it was cool to hear stories of Black Flag and road stories. But at the end of one of his VHS talks, he read a poem. And I was like a kid and there was like this dude, you know, who looked like he would like shit kick you with the tattoos, a scary dude. And all of a sudden he's like reading this like kind of beautiful, touching, sad poetry. And it, it kind of sparked something in me, you know, it kind of made me want to pick up the pen. And I was already kind of down with reading Leonard Cohen's works because of my mom's books around. But uh, yeah, that kind of is what sparked me. Um, so I'm always, I'm still writing. Um it's I think harder to do when um it's easier to write that when I I live a, a a pretty quiet life now so I'm not around people all too much and most of my poetry is uh, me not understanding people and uh and um trying to figure out uh people so I think my slow down my my lack of it now is because I'm I'm somewhat of a home but an extreme homebody so it only really comes up like it came up the other day when i wrote on a postcard because i was back home visiting friends and family and uh, those questions arise with my um you know questioning of whatever and it's just easier to write it as a poem because you can kind of camouflage it and kind of work it out it's like a diary i guess but um but you know a bit uh with prettier words but I have to ask, uh, Stephen, what is next for you? Like, is there anything we happen to miss during tonight's interview? Anything else you do still want to talk about or promote? Well, we still got you here live on 99.9 Punk World Radio FM this evening. Bro, that's such a good station call that you got down. I got to say that first off is impressive that you, that two sentences comes out that well and that that uh, that's smooth. Um, I have a comic book I've written um, that um, I haven't announced yet uh i got the it's all um 
I've been writing it for a really long time and uh, I found an artist almost a year ago today and the first book is going to be five, five or seven books and the first book is done. I got the cover today um, that we're kind of going back and forth with and as soon as that kind of gets nailed down, probably in the next week, I'll have announced uh, that comic book and announced uh, pre-orders for it where you can get, download it on your Kindle or on Comixology or hopefully get a paper copy of it. It'll be like one floppy. And uh, I'm excited about it. It's a um, there's no capes uh, or tights or flights in it. It's it's a um, it takes place in India in the 90s, and it's a revenge story of a of a of, of, a, of a sexual abuse survivor who um, starts killing and uh, lashing out. And she meets um, an older gentleman who's um, somewhat of a trained killer through the government. Uh, through the Forest Guard and Protection of Animals, because how they're sacred in India, they kind of joined forces. And uh, um, yeah, it's not like I know. I know it doesn't sound like a fun read, but I hope people like it. And I and I hope anyone that's into um, a revenge story of a of a young lady uh, killing some evil dudes, I hope will uh, check it out. And um, that will hopefully be announced on my social medias in the next week. It's called uh, Chaya and the Red Hand. And uh, yeah, that's the thing that's coming up the most besides my uh, radio show that's on. Let's see if I can do what you do. Besides my radio show that's on Thursdays on StrangerRadio.com. That's 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. on the West Coast. Stranger Radio. Fuck, I don't have a tag for it. I, I got I to gotta get that better. But see, honestly, though, you've been in this for so much longer, man. I got to say, I listened to your radio station, man. Before I even got into radio, I listened to your radio station. Oh, man. right on, I, man. So it's like I've definitely been a fan, man. Like... I mean, I, I've been a fan since, you know, just your early days in the music industry. That's how I knew a lot of this stuff. When I did the questions last night for this interview, normally I do research. Half, I got about seven questions done. I think the only one I looked up was a Lexus commercial because I literally didn't. <laughs> I was like, I got to find something else other than just Gob and all the other music he's done. Then I saw a Lexus commercial. I was like, well, that will definitely take the interview to a different, uh, a different dimension for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> They're great cars. <laughs> I got to say, they definitely are way out of my price range. I still drive a 10 year old Ford Focus. But oh, I hear you, man. I maybe got one day fun. we'll get the Lexus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, Stephen, I, I got to say, first and foremost, that comic book that you actually got, gave us a little rundown about, I got to say, it definitely sounds like such a p powerful read, but a phenomenal read at that. I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm an avid co comic book collector myself, so I'm definitely excited just for you to actually release more details because I'm super interested in actually giving that a read. Oh, right on, man. Well, you got to give me your details. I'll send you a copy. And that's also right. It takes us back to uh, talking about that show on my uh, station, Punk is Dad, with the host. He's a crazy comic book nerd as well. We actually um, have done some comic book YouTube kind of chats together. So uh, I really think that might be your next favorite show on Stranger Radio, Punk is Dad, which is Saturdays bi-weekly. Stranger Radio, 1 p.m. I don't know. Hey, Saturday is 1 p.m. I don't even I'm, I'm not even at work at that time. So okay. it looks like I'm going to be hovering around the radio. There we go. Yeah, man. <laughs> Before we part ways, actually, this evening, Stephen, I got to ask, well, what are your social media handles? Personally, I know your social media handles, but for the people that are watching or listening, how can they follow you? And of course, everything you currently got going on this year in 2023. For sure. The easiest way, if you go to um, my website, stephenfairweather.com, all that shit's up there. Um, I have like a YouTube show. I, I do. I try to do these comedic rants off the top of my radio show and, and friends got me to do um, like a YouTube show where I kind of turn those comedic rants into YouTube videos with like visuals and shit. So that's up there under the video section. Um, if you want dumb jokes, follow me on Twitter. Um, I dabble in photography, so if you want to see um, when that comic book comes out um, or any kind of gob stuff that gets announced on there, sometimes I'll, I'll repost that. Um, and my my amateur photography and my comic book, it's just Stephen Fairweather. It's just my full name on um, Instagram. And, um, and yeah, that's it. That's just the two, really. And I got to say, first and foremost, Stephen, thank you so much for just giving us a bit of your time here this evening, so, uh, talking with me via video on YouTube. And of course, man, just on, our, on my radio station airwaves, it was such an honor just to speak with, you know, a member of GOB, a phenomenal writer, a phenomenal fellow radio host. It was such an honor this evening. And hopefully down the line, we can make this happen again sometime soon. But for now, I got to say thank you again and definitely have yourself a phenomenal night. Thank you, DJ Amora. Uh, appreciate you and everyone that listens. And uh, you're doing a hell of a job. You, you kill it on these uh, 
interviews and uh and and my love to cone on uh was it thursday you're seeing cone uh, thursday yeah yeah love out to him he's such a he's such a handsome hunk too what a, what a what lucky guy you are to see that guy to be honest with you i have been a sum 41 fan for years i mean like i actually like a lot of their music saved me when i was younger man so i mean when i reached out to cone i looked at my wife i was like you know what i'm gonna reach out to sum 41 i'm like they're probably gonna be like yeah whatever like you know what i mean so i reached out next thing you know i think it was like the next day i was sitting there and i opened my phone i thought it, it said cone i thought it just said like he was going live or something then i looked and he's like yeah i'm, I'm down and i was like holy shit that's awesome <laughs> I, was, and he, I was like what and he also has that radio he does terrestrial radio too i've been trying to steal him to come on to stranger radio because i always want to listen to episodes after they're not live like i want to be able to go and listen to them anytime and where he's at now, I think it's just terrestrial. I think which is dope because it's old school. But I would always love to like re-listen to it if you're at the gym or whatever. You can kind of put on old episodes. So I've been trying to steal that. Maybe you can help me steal that fucker and bring him over to Stranger Radio because I know he's killing it on, on real radio. But it, maybe it's time for Stranger Radio. And he he's such a the amazing thing about that band, man. They're they're fucking huge, but they're Cone and uh, Stevo that's no longer with them. But I only really um, know Cone and somewhat of uh, of of Dave. It's the fucking nicest dudes, man. Like, they're such nice, uh, down to earth, like kind, kind. Speaking of, I know we got to go, but speaking of kind, even when we played, we played a show with them in um, Toronto, and it was like a huge show for us, and you know, a normal show for them, which is fucking massive. And at the end of it, at the end of the night, Dave's like putting his his family into the into the bus, and he's like, "Hey, I saw you have a you published a book of poetry. Like, that's amazing. Like, just for a dude." to like acknowledge that like you have and uh, con congratulate me is just uh, shows you how sweet, how truly sweet behind the scenes sweet those fucking guys are. So love out to those guys for sure, man. And even just a girl, like watching a lot of their interviews, man, like, the, the, a lot, a lot of people, I'm not saying everybody, but some people, when they get like the fame and the money, sometimes they kind of lose who they really are. But those guys have been 100% down to earth. You can even see how genuinely genuine they are during their interviews, man. They're definitely some stand up guys. Yeah, I know. There's such a cliche about the like, Canadian fucking dudes, but like you kind of, you, you do see it because there is like this kind of, um, you know, there's always like a, a politeness, but then when you see true kindness, when they don't have to be, when it's behind the scenes, when it's like backstage and like, they don't have to fucking say nothing to you because who, who am I is, uh, it's, it's so rad. And people should know that, that those guys, those, especially those two dudes are just actually great. Just great yeah. dudes. I got, I got to agree. And I really hope they actually do a Canadian tour this year. I, I saw that they're actually going back to Germany, which I wish them nothing but safe travels. But as a fan, I, they were they did Blues Fest in Ottawa last year, and I had to work the same night. I really wish I would have called in sick because now I'm kicking my ass over it. Yeah, no doubt. They, they, they're so busy. It's crazy. People don't really understand how busy those dudes are. They're, I think they're going to Japan in in March, like with Bad Religion. It's like Offspring, but some 41 and Bad Religion. And yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy tour, man. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely going to be jet lagged in a half. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm, so, I'm just jealous. That's amazing. But I got to say, first and foremost, again, Stephen, thank you so much for your time, man. Just honestly being able to chop it up with a fellow fan and interviewer and just giving me your time this evening. You could have you could have said no, but you actually genuinely gave me your time. And I greatly appreciate that. Hopefully down the line, we can make this happen again sometime soon. But for now, I got to say thank you so much again. And hopefully down the line, I can come out and see a gob show next time you guys actually hit the road. Love to have you, man. Whenever we're um, you're just outside of Kingston. Uh, Kingston, yeah, I'm in between uh, Kingston and Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. Whenever we're out there, man, you're uh, you'll be a, uh, our guest for sure. We'd love to have you, brother. Hey, sounds like a plan to me. I can't, I can't, I can't say no to that at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Thank you so much again, Stephen. Definitely have yourself a phenomenal night, and of course, a phenomenal. Thank you, brother.